And this is time now to say good afternoon to all students, teachers, and presenters. Welcome to the first annual School District 83 CAMRT Career Exploration Series featuring the health service sector. Uh, before I get to the introductions, I just wish to acknowledge this webinar and panel discussion is hosted on the traditional unceded territory of the Sokwetmik people, which we now call Salmon Arm. I know I feel grateful being here on Sokwetmik Hulu. Uh, we had a gorgeous sunny day here. Um, I don't know how it is like in where we are getting it. I see we have people down in Chilliwack, New Westminster, Williams Lake at this point, of course, in uh, the North Okanagan, Shushwap. Um, you know, it's a uh, beautiful sunny day, high minus two. Always feel grateful to be here. I do wish to acknowledge as well, literally the dozens of other Indigenous groups that do exist on all the territories that are covered in this broadcast. Um, I'm your host, George Richard. I'm School District 83's Career Education Coordinator. Here's some housekeeping items uh, for today's session for teachers and students. Uh, please always leave your screens and mics off so we can make sure we don't have background noise at all or to protect people's privacy uh, during this 75 minute session. If a student or teacher does have a question, what we would ask you to do is to write it in the chat. Uh, it will then be read out to our panelists to respond to. Uh, you can write your question at any time, but we may not be answering that question until we get to the question portion of the meeting. Maybe we might be able to do it in between uh, or it'll be at the end of all presentations. Uh, so a reminder, if you can, and if you have joined, please put your name, well, not your name per se, but you can put what school, school district you're from, your class and anything like that and put that in the chat uh, so that we are able to uh, see where you're coming from. Uh, and now I'd like to hand this presentation off to Sarah Erdili. Uh, she's the provincial manager for the Canadian Association of Medical Radiation Technologists. Thanks for co-hosting today. Thank you so much, George, for that introduction. And thank you for inviting us to present to the, the audience today. We're thrilled to be here. Uh, so my name is Sarah Erdely, and I'm the Provincial Manager for BC at the Canadian Association of Medical Radiation Technologists, or CAMRT. And I'm actually joining from Victoria today. I'm also an MRT, and I teach part-time at the Medical Radiography Program at Camosun College. I'd just like to briefly go over the outline for the presentation today. So first, what I'd like to do is provide an overview of the MRT profession and share some fun and interesting facts about medical imaging and radiation therapy. And then later in the presentation, you're going to hear personal stories from four guest speakers who are members of the profession and they have clinical experience working in hospitals and cancer centers around the province. And then at the end, I'll go over some information on how do you become an MRT, what's the job market like, and where can you go to school here locally? And then at the very end, we'll open it up to questions. So just remember, you can ask a question at any time throughout the presentation, and we'll be able to come back to these at the end. So we'll just start by taking a look at who MRTs are and what do they do. So MRT stands for Medical Radiation Technologists. We are healthcare professionals and we perform medical imaging and radiation therapy procedures. We also, as part of doing that, we apply prescribed forms of energy. So that's ionizing radiation or electromagnetism, for example, to patients to diagnose them or to provide treatments or therapeutic procedures. So we practice in hospitals, clinics, academic institutions, cancer centers, and we contribute to the diagnosis and treatment of millions of patients each year. So the MRT profession, it's often described as an art and a science because we combine patient care with technological expertise. So all of us here today who you're going to meet shortly are medical radiation technologists. 
However, each of us has a distinct specialty. So we have radiological technologists and radiological technology involves the use of x-rays to produce images of the body. There's a few subspecialties within this discipline. So some of you may have heard of uh, CT or computed tomography scan, or maybe a mammogram. So that's breast imaging, x-rays of the breast or interventional radiology. So that's another branch within the radiological technology discipline where we assist with uh, specialized procedures. Some of you may have heard of MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. So in this aspect of the MRT practice, we use radio frequency waves in conjunction with extremely powerful magnets to produce images of the body. One of our guest speakers will get into that a little bit more with you today and her experiences practicing in this discipline. And then along with surgery and chemotherapy, radiation therapy, is one of the three main modalities used to treat cancer. So radiation therapy uses ionizing radiation to target cancer cells, to kill them, or to stop them from growing or reproducing. We also have a guest speaker here today that's going to share her experiences practicing in this side of things. And then the other discipline is called nuclear medicine. Nuclear medicine involves the use of radiopharmaceuticals. So it's a radioactive material that we use to evaluate the function of specific organs. And while each type of MRT brings a unique skill set to patient care, all MRTs belong to the same professional family, and we share a professional competency profile, which outlines all of the knowledge, skills, and judgment that's needed to practice safely and effectively within our profession. So there's a link at the bottom of the slide here, imageofcare.ca, and you can visit that website to find a little bit more information about each of the specialty areas if you'd like to go back after the presentation. So speaking about what we all have in common, we have something called the Entry to Practice Competency Profile that describes the practice requirements for all MRTs or all members of our profession in Canada. And these requirements relate to the roles that we play in patient care. And these roles are depicted on the graphic here. So as care providers, MRTs practice with empathy, we're committed to ensuring all patients are treated with dignity, equality, and respect. As healthcare professionals, our actions and our decisions are guided by professional values, and we have ethical and legal responsibilities. Also, because healthcare is a team effort, MRTs must be effective communicators and collaborators. And like many healthcare professions, Many members of our profession can work with students in training or support recent graduates to achieve higher levels of proficiency. We also contribute a really unique perspective on patient care, and we help to ensure ongoing improvements in healthcare delivery. So MRTs also act as leaders and clinical experts among their peers and their patients and their healthcare professional colleagues. And then finally, MRTs can also be described as scholarly practitioners and lifelong learners. So just like the world around us is constantly changing, so too is MRT practice. And this makes our field very interesting. Uh, new technologies and new evidence influences the way we provide care to patients. And the pandemic over the last several years was a good example of, of things that we had to do to adapt and figure out a way to do things differently. And that was true for us in our work as well. So before we get to our guest speakers, I just thought I would share kind of five fun facts about medical imaging and radiation therapy. And as I just mentioned, medical imaging technology continues to evolve because of all of these advancements and new scientific discoveries. So this will just give you a little bit of an idea of the evolution of this field and kind of where we started, where we're going, where we are right now. So the first fact that I have for you is that it's been more than 120 years since x-rays were discovered. This discovery was made by a German scientist named Röntgen on November 8th of 1895. So in Canada, we now celebrate something called MRT Week, Medical Radiation Technology Week, and this takes place the week of November 8th every year to commemorate this discovery, which really started our field. And the picture on the left here is just a famous picture of the first x-ray that was taken, a picture of 
Röntgen's wife's hand. Uh, the picture in the middle there gives you an idea of what x-rays look like today. Due to these technological advancements, we're able to visualize anatomy with much more clarity and detail now. And the final image on the slide is showing a 3D look at blood vessels in the neck and the head. These types of images are obtained by injecting a contrast dye and then taking a scan that's tied with the injection. So my next fact for you is that BC's first cancer center or cancer treatment center opened in 1938. There's now six cancer centers in the province with more planned in the future. And MRTs play a critical role in cancer care. BC has several cancer screening programs. So MRTs perform screening mammography or x-rays of the breast. And now we have a lung screening program where we're doing CT scans for lung screening. MRTs who work in medical imaging also play a role in diagnosing and monitoring cancer by taking images that, images that show us what's happening inside the body. And MRTs who specialize in radiation therapy play an important role in treatment. My next fact is that the nuclear medicine became a discipline in 1966. So as science and technology continue to evolve, new discoveries were made and that's what allowed this field of imaging to emerge as a new discipline. Nuclear medicine technologists administer something called radioactive materials or radiopharmaceuticals. And this is unique from other types of medical imaging. So where x-rays can demonstrate the structure or the anatomy, nuclear medicine primarily shows the functioning. And even if there's a very small change that would be difficult to see on other types of imaging, nuclear medicine will identify the area and give information about what's happening on a cellular level. So this is why nuclear medicine is also sometimes called molecular imaging. We don't have a nuclear medicine technologist joining us today, but again, if you go to that website, imageofcare.ca, you'll find more information about this field. And you can also find a video recording that includes a nuclear medicine technologist from BC speaking about her role in her career path, if you're curious about this one. My next fun fact is about CT and MRI and when they came into our work. And so this was well after the discovery of x-rays. CT is short for computed tomography and MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. And these types of imaging allow us to see the body in cross section or slices and they give a 3D perspective of our anatomical structures. So while the machines may look similar, CT uses an X-ray beam, while MRI uses magnetic field and radio waves to create images. And this just gives us a bit of a sneak peek behind one of the control rooms. You can kind of see on the display monitor there on the computer screen, the different cross-sectional perspectives of the body. So when you enter this field, learning about anatomy is a large component of your education. And the final fact that I'd like to share came from a report that was shared by the Ministry of Health in the summer of 2022. And that report revealed that over a million MRI and CT scans were performed in BC in the year prior. So that just shows how essential we are and the procedures that we perform are to the healthcare system. So this makes our job very special. We get to help so many people who rely on us for an important step in their healthcare journey. Uh, recent data shows that three in five Canadians receive care from medical imaging technologists each year, and about half of cancer patients undergo radiation therapy as part of their cancer treatment. So we do have a very important role in this profession to help patients feel as comfortable as possible during these tests and treatments and using our expertise to ensure quality and safe care. So uh, we're gonna move on to our, our panel and our guest speakers, and they will help you gain a better understanding about what it's like to work in the profession. We're going to share personal stories about what led each of us to choose a career as an MRT, what a day in the life of our jobs looks like, what we love about our jobs, what we find challenging about our jobs and more. 
So our guest speakers, they're, they're going to stay here until the end. So if you have a question for one of them, you can type it in the chat and then we'll be able to answer that during the question and answer period. So first up, we'd like to welcome Milo to share their personal story about becoming an MRT. Thank you so much for being here today, Milo. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Sarah and George, for that lovely introduction. And so my name's Milo. I work in um, general radiography or just general x-ray, working for two years. Um, I've been working in Ontario as well as BC. So I've done one year in Ontario. I was working at Ottawa at a private clinic. And I've done one year in Kamloops at the Royal Inland Hospital. So whatever has led me to uh, pursuing the career of an MRT is that I actually was previously working at a different job. I originally have a degree in uh, illustration, so I am a fine artist. <laughs> and I was working at a visual effects house. I was working on um, movies. We did movies for Disney. We did, I worked on Parts of the Caribbean. I worked on the new Ghostbusters. I worked on several bad movies. I worked on the last Resident Evil movie. I worked on the last Underworld movie. Those were very bad movies, but they were very fun to work on. Um, but working in that field was very challenging. I would usually work 12 hour shifts um, for months at a time, just due to time constraints and crunch culture. Uh, I was sitting at a desk all day I was doing quick little repetitive motions every day. It put a huge strain on my body and my wrists and my mental health as well. And after two years of that, I decided enough was enough. So I actually developed carpal tunnel due to working so long and getting that diagnosed, I actually went to a hospital and I got my wrist ultrasounded and I remember looking at the screen and I asked the technologist was like how long did it take you to become an ultrasound technologist and he said three years and I said do you find it interesting and he said I find it has great variety <laughs> um, I'm not sure if he was thrilled with his job but I was thrilled with the idea of his job so I started to research into health careers that I didn't have to go to med school for. I had already done four years of school previously. I was not looking to add to that tally at all. Um, and I actually started to go through the job description of working in x-ray. And the idea appealed to me very greatly because while I did get to now not work at a desk, and I did get to talk to people. I only talked to people for a short amount of time. <laughs> X-ray exams are usually very quick. They're five to 15 minutes, depending on what your patient can do for you. And that meant I got to see a lot of people for a little bit of time throughout the day. And I am a social creature. So that appealed to me a lot more than sitting at a desk all day. Um, I also got to use some of my art skills. As Sarah said, working in x-ray is a science and an art. So you do have to use some visual problem solving skills to get the images that you want um, within what your equipment has or is capable of and what your patient can do. So that was also very, very great. Um, so I went to school for that and it was, three years. Actually, I had to take an extra year. So sadly, it's another four years of school for me. Um, but it all worked out in the end. And I'm very glad that I did it. Um, and just going through my new day, 
uh, I actually work nights. So I work the graveyard shift from 1030 at night to 630 in the morning. Most people don't like to work nights, but I am a night owl. So this lines up very well with not waking up at eight for me. Um, but when I get to work, I change into OR scrubs because I might actually go into the operating theater. And that is something that I didn't get to do in Ontario when I was working at my clinic. We just had a previous slide. There's just the table and the equipment that's on the wall. Um, so I get to play with more things now in the hospital, which is kind of a plus. There's more variety. Uh, so going to the operating theater, you have something called a C arm, which is on the left there. Um, it is a big C. It actually takes uh, fluoroscopy. So it can take single images if the surgeon wants it, or if you hold down a button, it can take a live recording of whatever he's doing in there. Um, so we'll see if any of my coworkers are still up in the operating room, if they're working on a case or if they're closing something up, or if um, one of the surgeons has something extra that they've decided to do later at night, I'll make sure that that is all good to go. Um, if everything's good out there and I don't have to go up and everything's done in the operating room, that's great. Um, I usually see if there's any inpatient exams that need to be completed that haven't. Normally, my coworkers are very good at not letting those hang around. Um, and then because there's no inpatients really scheduled overnight, it's just whatever comes in from the emergency room. Um, that can be challenging in its own way because sometimes these people are not well physically. <laughs> Sometimes they are not well mentally. Um, and because it's the night, you are working with reduced staff. So dealing with intoxicated or upset people is a part of patient care that is not really taught in school, but it's definitely a soft skill. You have to bring out your mom voice, what I like to call it sometimes. And sometimes you just have to be very patient with whoever you're dealing with. So that part of the job is a lot of variety in the sense of just talking to people in addition to what exams you're doing. Usually at night we do chests. Lots of people come in complaining of chest pain. Sometimes someone's tripped and fallen in the dark or they're drunk and they fall in. That's also fine. People do all sorts of things. And, you know, you x-ray their hands, their feet. Hopefully they're nice for you and they don't move. Many, many people are very thankful that you're there in the middle of the night, which is kind of nice. Um, so that's also something that uh, I didn't really get positive feedback in my last job, but now I do. And it's nice. <laughs> um, so the things I do other than just doing exams for the ER, there's also some sort of just basic ad administrative stuff where you just sort of stock the supplies in the rooms, make sure everything's available for the day staff because it gets very, very busy there. Um, and then that's sort of the end of my day. I greet the morning staff and I go home and sleep. Um, the things that actually is a picture of the back end of Royal Inland, you can see a lovely view of the parking lot. And because I work nights, I get to see sunsets and sunrises and they are very pretty. So that is one pro for working nights. Um, so things that I love about my job is the variety of the patients and the exams. I always know the end goal. So every x-ray exam, you need a, images that look a certain way. So your job is to get the images to look that way, because if they're all the same and they're all lined up, the radiologist can see what's wrong or what's not wrong, and it'll make their job a lot easier. Um, you Normally there's two exams or two images that you do that are at 90 degrees. So you have a hand flat or a hand on its side. You always have to have two. So at least they can see if anything's moved from left to right or front to back. 
in that part of the body. That variety is very interesting to me. I like to not have a monotonous job. Um, I also don't get to sit at a desk anymore. So having a job that I didn't like allowed me to find a job with elements that I did like. I don't have to sit at a desk. I do get variety with people and with exams. I do still use creative problems, problem solving skills and I don't work alone. So working on nights, sometimes you do work alone. I usually only have one coworker with me. The good news is you usually get along very well with that coworker. Um, but not working alone is stressful, but you can still get help from other departments. And when you don't work alone, it is very nice because you have help right beside you. Um, things that are challenging other than just working alone um, and then just things about the job is since I work nights, I have to get all of my errands before all the stores close. And in Kamloops, many of those stores close at six. So if I don't wake up at two or three and get out and run around, I don't get groceries. So that is something you have to consider when you're living in a small town is, you know, can I do these hours actually work? for me, can I actually feasibly live while doing this? Um, the great thing actually that I love about just general x-ray is you can work anywhere in the country. You can actually now work anywhere in many countries. Um, I worked, I grew up in Ontario and I worked for a year in Ontario, but I don't really want to live there. So I was able to get a job that allows me to go to pretty much any province and have a guaranteed job lined up. I don't have to get an extra piece of certification or um, like a diploma for something extra. I can go anywhere in the country. I can live anywhere in the country. And that flexibility is very, very appealing to me. Um, one of my coworkers is actually moving to New Zealand because they have a agreement uh, with Camarch. So she doesn't have to do anything extra before she goes to live and work in New Zealand. Another one of my coworkers is actually visiting from Australia. She took a six month contract here so she could run around in Canadian winter, and then she's going back to Australia. So it was, uh, it's a, a good move if you like to travel, but also don't like to be broke. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, uh, Milo, for sharing that unique perspective on our profession. And you're coming from someone who's been working uh, a night shift. That's a little bit different. We do shift work in our profession. And um yeah, we get we get to do all kinds of things. So we really appreciate all of the experiences and stories and your perspective on, on what it's been like for you so far in the first couple of years in your career. So thank you so much. All right, adios. So we're going to welcome up um, Nancy, who's going to share her personal story about her fulfilling career as an MRT. And thank you so much for being here today, Nancy. It, it's my pleasure. You can hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, no, it really is my pleasure. I, I never get tired of talking about this career because it's been such a, a dynamic journey for me. And I'm thrilled to hear of Milo's background because I too have a creative artistic background. I worked in the fashion industry and I found this job to be, like I said, even um, post uh, what I did before, this has been the best job I've ever had and uh, the best decision to make for me. Um, I did start off by studying at BCIT. Uh, I needed to upgrade my physics. Um, I love science too, but um, I really found that this met, ticked a lot of boxes for me in terms of the kinds of things that I liked. Um, I worked in general x-ray to start out with. So it, as uh, Milo said, as 
uh, commented in, in the operating room in general x-ray. I worked with the big C arms as well. I worked in eMERGE um, and also did a mobile x-ray as well at the patient's bedside. So got a really good solid um, foundation when I first started and worked in very, very busy hospitals like St. Paul's and downtown Vancouver and also in a private clinic. So I've been all around and um, the career has just been so satisfying for me. Um, it, I'm also thrilled to hear of how this other people agree with me in that it's truly the blending of art and science. Um, you really are designing an image. Um, so you've got to think outside the box, especially if you've got someone, you're working in eMERGE at St. Paul's, for example, and this person is in a lot of pain. Um, they can't bend their arm. You're trying to do an elbow or a hand or whatever. So you've got to be able to think about, okay, how can I capture this image and get the best image possible for the radiologist so they can do their job? Um, that's your responsibility. And it, it really is, although some people might go, oh, I don't know whether I could. Um, you get such a solid training and, and such a good background of experience um, at these schools uh, that you do have a sense of confidence and you've got always lots of support. And so being able to figure out what is the best way to capture that joint space or whatever, if it, for example, is an elbow that's been broken in a car accident or somebody's fallen, um, you are designing images. Um, so, and each patient has a different range of motion. Um, they could be really stressed and upset. So you have to really be able to think on your feet, um, stay calm. You really set the tone in that room uh, so you're better to stay calm and be able to just handle the patient. A lot of them, we're seeing them not at their best. Uh, they're in having a traumatic thing happen to them. So you really have the ability to help them. And that's been very gratifying as well. Now, I was originally supposed to be going into MRI. And it's funny how life is. It tends to take you on a bit of a journey What that you think, especially as high school students, you think, okay, this is the road I'm going to go down. And I did that too. This was definitely what I was going to do for the rest of my life. But it's funny how life is. And so I was led into, after, again, working for years in general x-ray, um, being led into breast imaging. Um, the thing that was, was sort of attracting me is I had lost two really important people in my life to breast cancer. And so I began to watch these mammographers, the people that do um, mammogram images and uh, ask questions. Now, once I made that decision though, to pursue this, I can't tell you enough, the world really opened up to me and I saw different opportunities come my way. And, you know, I had to work really hard. And, but when it's, when you're doing something that you really love, uh, working hard isn't hard. You just, you have to stay focused and, and certainly um, there's always education that you, you will be needing to upgrade, but it, it's, it's fun. It's, it's new technology, always the latest in, in what's happening in this career. Again, it's very dynamic. There's so many things that are happening and advancements being made. Um, I worked with the best teachers and my senior techs that that really helped me and supported me and I really developed the specialty now um sorry I was just didn't mean to interrupt but uh when I was looking at the picture here yeah with that man that's beside you he he strikes me as this is a person I may know or may have seen that's not Adrian <laughs> Dix the, uh, yes it is actually it is so, Adrian Dix the health minister from years ago just making sure that's and, Kevin Falcon or Kevin Falcon, sorry. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So this is what I, yeah, and thanks for pointing that out. Um, you know, when I started working in mammography, like I said, the world opened up. I had these opportunities to work that very machine that you see and uh, the screens and everything. Uh, I was able to help buy that equipment. And so travel to different sites in the United States and Canada looking at different uh, digital equipment 
Um, and so we decided on this, this equipment. And um, our clinic, which was at Mount St. Joseph's Hospital in Vancouver, was the first of its kind in Canada. And it was called the Rapid Access Clinic. And I, they're still doing excellent work to this day where it's sort of everything under one roof and um, was very um, pivotal in helping patients go through their whole journey. Uh, it's very stressful in anything when you have an injury or you're inquiring as to whether you might have a more serious disease. So being able to do all the modalities, whether it's ultrasound, this is mammography, a biopsies, everything under one roof in a timely fashion is really key. Um, so I was part of that team. And again, that's another quality that was really exciting. I didn't realize how wonderful it was to be part of a team like that, but you really are helping each other and you're, you're bringing that patient through that whole journey and you make a lot of impact. So it's really, really important. Um, so yes, this was the opportunities that I had. And I think Sarah, the next slide um, shows also me encouraging people to get a mammograms. I, I always said that the technologist is the best salesperson for mammograms or, or whatever, if you're working in CT and detect all these various things. We're good salespeople because we actually see through our pictures, through our images, we can see that, thank God this patient did come in or they, they were able to, you know, talk to their doctor and get in when they did feel that there was something changing. That's that in the cancer business, that's, that's really important. And so that I could be used as um, someone that could be a spokesperson to encourage women you know, mammograms save lives and um, it's so easy to pick up the phone and uh, book an appointment on your own. Um, so yes, um, I have, I've had the ability to do that and I've worked as at a provincial level as a leader. Um, so I was able to help my fellow technologists and also make a, a difference in patient care. Um, so I can't say enough about how gratifying this career is. Um, again, always changing, latest technology, ongoing education, but it means that you always have something to, there's something to look forward to, or you're always changing and, and there's never a dull moment. If you're just interested in a job that is just very, you know, um, day to day, uh, same old thing, but not a lot of people are, they like to have change and, and various things that they can develop in their own skill set. Well, medical imaging is the place to go because it there is so many opportunities for that. This was from a video series we did, again, helping women understand the, about mammograms, what it entails, why they're so important. And again, I was really pleased to work with the screening program at BC Cancer. Um, so the, the final thing that I wanted to leave with everyone is just my advice from my journey. And that is as in high school and, and as you as you go through life, don't be afraid to try things and to be open to seeking information. If there's something that's kind of piquing your interest, well, go and talk to that person that does that career. Um, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes because we've all done it. And it's through those mistakes that have that have brought us through and learn more about ourselves and what makes us happy and what, what types of skills can we bring to the job? And I think that's really important. I, I know that when I was 18, 17, there was a lot of pressure there and you felt like you had to have the, all the answers, but you don't need to do that. Just get out there and just live your life. Um, be curious, find out. There's a lot of information on the internet, but also talk to people um, in, and people, especially in my career, are happy to speak to students and young people about what it entails and where, where did they go to school and everything. So I would really encourage you to just be really open, ask questions and get out there and really live life. And in fact, one of those questions have come out now, not 
necessarily pertaining to the career that you have been doing with mammography screening, but from yeah. one of the uh, younger students, she says, how old do you have to be to start getting checkups for mammograms? Oh, excellent question. Mm -hmm. So in, in the province of BC, and we're one of the only province, there's a few provinces in Canada, but we start uh, screening mammograms, which means patients or women that don't have any symptoms, so they don't feel a lump or there isn't any changes. It's just for their maintenance, um, 40 years old. So if you have a really strong family history though, uh, you can start a few years younger than that. Um, of course, even at 18, at 25, at 35, if you feel a lump or you feel any changes, you should go to the doctor and and uh, and talk to them and, and get a checkup. But for screening, for women, and they don't need a family doctor to make a, a requisition for them, um, you can pick up the phone from 40 years on, 40 years on and onward. You never stop getting mammograms. Um, so yes, good question. Thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing all that. It's really a really neat perspective on our profession to see someone who's gone through and had all these different experiences from shaking the minister, health minister's hand, <laughs> helping select equipment to being part of media campaigns that help promote breast screening to women. It's just amazing all the different things that you've done. So thanks again for sharing that. Thank you. My pleasure. So we're going to welcome Savannah next, who's going to share her personal journey and tell you a little bit about MRI. And thank you again for being here, Savannah. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Savannah. I live in Victoria. I am an x-ray and MRI tech. I have done x-ray for seven years and MRI for four. Um, I'll be focusing on the MRI portion today. Um, I went through Camosun for it. Um, it was a two-year program. And then I took a um, an online course uh, to through BCIT for MRI. And I think it's, just to piggyback off what Nancy was saying, I do think it's really important. I didn't start um, as Milo and Nancy did in a different career. Um, when I was in high school, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and I was I was looking into things and knew I wanted to work with people and technology but I didn't really know it was out there I knew I kind of wanted to work in a hospital but wasn't really sure what what would work for me um, but I love seeing people that come from other careers that I work with um, just because they they just give a different perspective to it and thinking you have to have one career for your whole life as I've gotten older it's I, I'm looking into going into teaching as well so just like Sarah did so um, I think it's really valuable just to have it in the back of your head that making a choice isn't a full life choice and there's so many places for you to grow uh, through just being an MRT being, being part of your career so yeah, I wanted in high school, I was trying to see what I wanted to do. Um, I did zero research on it, uh, but I was probably watching a show or something and I saw them doing imaging and specifically MRI. And I was like, oh, that's what I wanted to, do, wanted to do. And so even knowing that's what I wanted to do, I didn't do any research on it. Thought, oh, I have to be a doctor to do that because on the show, you have to be a doctor. So I went to university and about three years into my degree, I, um, one of my soccer friends, she ended up um, getting into the Camosun program, which uh, I noticed, oh my gosh, they have an x-ray program. That's what I want to do. So I finished my degree and applied for Camosun. I also applied to BCIT and to the College of New, New Caledonia and Prince George, which all offer, um, they're all sister programs. They offer the two years in x-ray. And then after I did that, I spent a year working in Prince George and then took the MRI course online through BCIT. Um, and from there, you do a four-month practicum, and then I got a job. And so now I'm back working in Victoria, where I grew up, and I work at the Royal Jubilee Hospital. And yeah, I love it. Um, I, I love the imaging parts of it. So there's me. Um, <laughs> we So we use magnets. 
uh, MRIs as magnets and radio frequency pulses uh, to affect the body. It affects, it excites the hydrogen atoms in the body. Um, and as they relax, they give off a signal. Different molecules have different amounts of hydrogen atom in, atoms in them. So they relax at different rates. And that gets computed by, um, by the computer um, to give different shades from range from white to black and every gray in between. Um, what I really like about it is that um, the pictures are really pretty. They're high definition because we get those that um, those signals, which I really do enjoy. Um, so I did it as a second discipline, and now BCIT is offering it as a first discipline, which is which is incredible. And you can do it right out of high school, which is great. Um, I went to university first, but you don't have to, which is which is wonderful. Um, but for my day in the life, um, we work with, just like the other disciplines, we work with inpatients and outpatients. So outpatients are people that are coming. Um, they've gone to their family doctor to get, they've got a cough for a while, something like that. They come in. Um, for us, it tends to be a lot of brains. People have headaches, um, knees, people injure their knees. I know a lot of my soccer friends have definitely injured theirs from time to time. Um, and we're really good at looking at soft tissue, ligament damage, um, but we can also look at, um, but we also look at vascular changes, things like that. So those are the outpatients we get. We also get inpatients. So inpatients are anything from people that are in the hospital, in emergency, to on the wards, they're long, they're long stay people. Um, we get anything from routine to trauma. Um, we don't get as much trauma as um, X-ray or CT does. They usually go there first before coming to us. But from time to time, we still do get intubated patients. Um, I would say the majority of intubated patients we get are from the intensive care unit. Um, and we're looking for brain death or if they've had a stroke post-procedure, things like that. Um, we're really good at picking up on strokes and um, checking on brain death for organ donation things like that um so we what's really nice about mri is everything in my hospital is scheduled so we have a set block for outpatients and then a few hours in the day probably five hours in the day where we schedule our own inpatients into that time um the biggest thing that we have to deal with is safety the magnet is always on so it's so people can come in with implanted devices. Um, if anyone's diabetic, you have insulin pumps, diabetic monitors, you have a little thing that sits on your shoulder, Libre Dexcom to help, um, to help monitor your sugars. Um, those can't go in, they'll burn you. Um, people have pacemakers, people have a little bit of everything. <laughs> so we have to go through this screening, um, going through implanted devices. If they've had gunshot wounds, shrapnel, surgery, um, some clips in the body heat up or or clips on a vessel might uh, be magnetic and they'll spin around and tear your vessel, which you don't want. So we have to be really, really vigilant uh, with the screening. But if they're cleared to go in, um, we'll take them into the machine. Most scans can range from 10 minutes. Uh, they are getting faster now, but probably about 10 minutes um, if we're looking at the brain and spine and also giving you contrast. For some people, that'll be around an hour, 45 minutes. So it really depends on, on what we're looking for and how much the patient can tolerate. Sometimes you would have to split that up um, into two different parts, uh, two different exams on different days, just because to be in the machine for an hour, 45 minutes is a lot. <laughs> it's very loud. So a big part of our job is having to give you hearing protection, makes a lot of construction electronic noises. I do tell all of my uh, patients, that's the world's worst DJ. It's absolutely terrible, <laughs> um, but it will get faster before I think it gets uh, gets quieter. It's already getting faster these days, which I'll get into a little bit later, but it's, it is quite interesting. So patients come in, we go through the screening form with them. We, go, we put them in the machine. Now, if you look at the picture there with me by the machine, the bore, so the circular part they go in, this is our largest machine <laughs> and it is quite small. It is smaller than a CT machine and it's a long tunnel, not so much a donut that CT is. So people get claustrophobic in there a lot. And that's part of the patient care that I really like is helping someone get through the test. You can talk to them in between pictures, but you can't talk to them during the pictures because it's so loud. 
a cloth over the eyes. Um, they have an alarm ball in their hand because it's so loud. We can't hear them if they're saying anything to us. So um, from time to time, if we have enough staff, um, some people are not having a good time, but they really want to get it done. Um, I will go into the machine. I'll hold their hand. I'll talk to them. Um, of course, I have hearing protection when I'm in there as well. Um, but patient care is a big, big thing for MRI along with safety, um, just because I, I understand it's not a person's favorite place to be. Um, sometimes we'll do injections, um, just an injection into the vein. It helps, um, tissues show up differently. So we'll see some highlighting on bone tissue. If they have a tumor, things like that, to see if there's any vascularity to it just adds a little information to the image. And as I said before, we scan pretty much every body part, um, for soft tissue. Um, CT is better for bone, but we also do get bone contusions, things like bone bruises. They show up as really bright on some pictures. Um, just gives the radiologist a better idea of what they're looking at. Um, a big thing that I love is working with technology and people. That's why I got into it. And that's why I love it. Um, as Milo was saying, um, it's really nice to have short interactions with people. Um, if they're a great patient and they're, you know, you just vibe really well with that person. It's excellent. It's a, it's a little bit of time and then they're gone. And if they're a terrible patient, then it's a little bit of time and they're gone. It's not like bedside nursing where you have to keep, you know, maybe dealing with this difficult patient. It's somebody you deal with and then you can let it go. And I think that's a really good part of this job as well is I don't take it home with me. Um, of course, these people are in really difficult positions and going through really difficult, difficult times, either mentally, we do a lot of brain scans or physically they've been in an accident or that we do look at a lot of cancers as well. Um, but my view is that I am there to help you and, and help you get a diagnosis or help you get treatment. Um, and my job is helping you hopefully become better. And once the day is done, the day is done and I'm, and I'm home and I don't have to focus on it. Um, and I really do love that aspect of it. Um, and as I said before, the imaging is really pretty. There's a lot of detail to it. So, um, so CT or x-ray can be kind of grainy sometimes, but, um, but MRI, I find just, you can see all the different tissues and it's pretty. <laughs> Um, things that are really challenging about MRI, um, you have to do when you're in school, you learn a lot of physics. And so if physics is not your strong point, that's okay. But, uh, it is something you do need to be aware of, um, going into it. You do learn a lot. I wouldn't say in, in my job, I use it that much, but it is something you have to know just how the machine works. Um, so if you can get through that. It's good. <laughs> um, and also the parameters. So we deal with a lot, a lot of parameters. So um, we deal with things that, um, as I said, they the molecules relax at different rates. Well, we want to see how much to excite them to see how much they relax. Um, because we use, we get tissues in the same plane. So if we're going left to right, our slices left to right, we will do that a couple times with different parameters. And so they'll show up differently. So one of them will show up with fluid bright and fat, fat bright. Some will show up with fluid dark and fat bright. And it just gives a better idea without giving contrast to what that mass is or what it's made of. Um, it also helps us see discs better on spines, things like that if someone has a slip disc. Um, so by doing that, um, we have to change up all these parameters and you do get to know them. You kind of know them off by heart because you do it so many times, but learning it can be a little difficult. And because we have all these different parameters and we have um, outside influence to the machine because it's a closed system, meaning that we have a copper cage around the entire, uh, the entire magnet room. Sometimes there can be holes in that cage and which result in artifacts. So it's just little imperfections on the image that degrade the image a little bit. And with MRI, you can't ever get rid of them, but you have to be able to mitigate them. You have to be able to figure out a way to move them off of the image or things like that, which can be a little tricky, um, especially when you're dealing with um, a patient who is moving. Um, so difficult patients are definitely a challenge too. If someone's confused, they like to move a lot. Now we, our pictures do take a while to get. They take about 
um, each individual individual picture will usually be between two to five minutes. And so if someone's moving in there, it shows up as really blurry and you can't really see it. So just good patient care, but sometimes if they're confused, it's really difficult to get that. So um, other than that, um, dealing with large patients as well can be an issue. We now have really good, um, we have really good uh, devices to help move them. Um, but yeah, I would say the most challenging thing would be the physics um, and the parameters and learning to deal with that. But the course is really good. You do learn how to deal with that. You do a practicum and it they show you how to deal with that, which is really helpful. I would say the most unique thing about this job um, is that it is getting a little it is getting faster, which is, will be really interesting. I think in the near future, we'll be moving to more like CT. It won't be, um, we won't have those scheduled times. Um, and the reason that that's happening is on the images, usually there's a bit of graininess to it and that's called noise. And they used to try to increase the signal to make it clearer. But now all of the companies, this is a Siemens machine, but all the companies are actually using AI to decrease the noise in the background. And so that's making some scans between a minute, minute and a half. And so we can now run an E in five minutes on this machine. So um, I'm really interested to see where it goes, but there's huge development just in this um, in this discipline in general. And coming from X-ray, um, I could have gone to CT, IR, interventional radiography, um, mammography, um, but yeah, I, I chose MRI and there's still so many different disciplines to try or to go to if I ever do you want to change? So I think that's definitely a benefit to the program overall. Thank you so much, Savannah. It's so interesting to hear some of the similarities and differences between x-ray and CT as well as MRI and just kind of your experience, how you've been able to go to a couple different places in the province, how you started with your x-ray diploma and you moved into MRI. So it gives a really good insight into what you can achieve within the first few years of your career as an MRT. So thanks again. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. So we're going to hear from Brielle as our last guest speaker. Uh, she's going to share her story about what it's like working in radiation therapy. Hey, Sarah. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm uh, Brielle, and I'm a radiation therapist currently working at BC Cancer Kelowna. I actually just recently became a radiation therapist just last year, so I've only been working for about nine months. Uh, but I graduated from BCIT's radiation program uh, just last year, so I'm really familiar with the program. Um, and I decided to apply to the program during my second year uh, when I was studying at UBCO, specifically in biochemistry, which was an interest of mine at the time. Uh, I'd done a lot of research online into different, uh, more specialized science programs because I wasn't really enjoying my biochemistry degree quite as much as I thought when I had first uh, gone into it after high school. Um, so I really wanted to find a science program that not only led me into a job after graduation, but was a career that I really thought that I would be passionate about. Um, so after learning a little bit more about radiation therapy, I went to a career fair that was at BCIT and kind of met the department head, talked about the program. Um, I decided to apply and then started it pretty soon after that. And it took me about three years before I completed because it's kind of a mix of in-class as well as clinical. So you work at one of the BC cancer sites like when you're a student as well. So you kind of go into the career uh, with a lot of job experience, which I really loved. So as a radiation therapist, I provide radiation treatment and care to cancer patients. That's what was mentioned before. So when someone's diagnosed with cancer, they're typically treated with surgery, chemo, and or radiation therapy. Uh, so radiation therapists handle the radiation therapy side of cancer treatment by creating treatment plans and actually administering the radiation treatment itself. So uh, radiation therapy consists of the uses of a radiation machine, uh, which is called a linear accelerator. And you can see that machine on the screen right now. So that's what we're mostly using. Now this machine directs high energy X-ray beams that are arranged to deliver a very specific dose of radiation to a patient's tumor. So it's not going throughout the entire 
body, patient's body, it's only very concentrated in a very specific point in the patient's body. And the goal is for the radiation to kill the cancer cells while ensuring as much like limited damage to the rest of the body as possible. Now, radiation therapy is quite quick. Um, most appointment times are only about 15 minutes. So you are seeing quite a few patients a day, probably about 20 to 30. Um, and most patients require multiple treatments um, that are given once a day for typically multiple weeks. So this means like the patients that we treat, you're seeing every day for multiple weeks at a time. So you really get to know your patients um, and you can really develop a good rapport with them, which is something that I really love. It's a very social job. And um, yeah, that's just, that's one of my favorite parts of it, that you really get to know your patients and you're kind of given the opportunity to really help not only manage some of their physical side effects that they're going through through treatment, but also kind of help them with their um, emotional needs as well. Because since you are the person that they're seeing every single day, they become more comfortable with you than they are with some of their other healthcare professionals. So it's, it's really great to be able to develop those kinds of relationships with your patients. Now, unfortunately, this is also what can make the job quite challenging because um, some of the patients that you're working with are really sick and some are even receiving end of life care. So that can be really hard to, to manage emotionally, especially because you are seeing them um, quite a few times throughout the week. Usually if um, a patient is receiving what we call palliative care, which is kind of end of life um, care, you're only seeing them for maybe a week or two weeks but it's really reassuring to know that you are able to provide the patient with the care that you can, even at the end of their life, and you're the ones that are trying to make them as comfortable as possible during that really hard time. Now, another one of my, uh, sorry, it's coming off cold, uh, favorite things working as a radiation therapist is the fact that we always work in a team. So when treating patients, we always work in pairs, we're always problem solving together um, in this career because every patient is so different. So we do a lot of problem solving. Um, so being able to adapt in the moment is really, really important. Um, and you also work with a lot of other healthcare professionals on a regular basis, such as doctors, nurses, nutritionists, clerks, counselors, the list goes on. It's a very, very, um, interprofessional team. It's very social. We're all kind of working together for a common goal. So radiation therapy is quite social. A, a huge part of the job is also working with new and advanced technologies, like a lot of the other uh, careers in uh, radiation technology. So yeah, the treatment of cancer is always changing, always evolving. New methods and technologies are always coming out. Uh, we actually recently just installed a new type of radiation machine, so it's slightly different than the linear accelerator that I showed you in the previous one. Um, it's the first of its kind in Canada, here in Kelowna, so we were really excited about that. I love working on that machine. Um, so yeah, um, so if you're a person who's really interested in working with new technology, um, this is definitely would be a great career for you. You're always learning, always adapting, which is great. So another perk of working at a cancer center, um, which is a little bit different from some of the other um, modalities, is that we work really regular hours. It's only um, Monday to Friday, and most centers are usually open from about 8 a.m. to about 5.30, but that can vary depending on the cancer center that you're working at. There are a few radiation emergencies, not too many, um, which can require treatment on the weekends, which that would be covered if they were you were working on call, but that's not something that's required at every center that you work at. I personally don't work on call. I might do that in the future, depending on where my career takes me, but um, I love being able to work Monday to Friday. I'm not huge on the late night shifts. I like being able to have my weekends. So that's something that I really love about this job. So if you don't mind switching slides, I just kind of want to show, okay. So this slide might be a little bit confusing, but I really wanted to show you guys kind of a picture of what a radiation plan can look like. So this is a CT scan or more simply just a picture 
of a patient's abdomen with what we call a color wash on top. So the red color signifies the area of the body that's gonna receive the high dose of radiation. And then the surrounding blue is where the patient is just gonna receive like a low dose. So the red area would technically signify where the tumor is or where the doctor has decided they want to treat with the high dose of radiation. Now we fine tune everything down to the millimeter. So we're very, very picky about exactly where we're directing the radiation. So if you're somebody who's really like detail oriented, kind of likes to fiddle around with things until they're like just perfect, this is a great career job for you because that is something that we do a lot. We are very particular, we are very picky about how things are done. Like I said, we go down to the millimeter to make sure things are just right. <sighs> well, now just to finish things up. Um, uh, well, when I was in high school, I was kind of trying to figure things out. I knew that I was really interested in healthcare, but I knew I didn't want to be a nurse and I knew I didn't, didn't want to be a doctor. Um, and I didn't really realize there were so many other jobs in between that. Because when you're younger, like you see on TV, like all you see is like the doctors are doing everything, the nurses are doing everything. You don't realize that there's so many other healthcare careers out there. So some of the other speakers have said, I just think my best advice is, you know, figure out what's out there explore your options because there's so many options out there you just kind of have to go out and find them thank you so much for sharing that and for going over that picture with us it's always fascinating to learn about what is happening in other mrt disciplines and kind of just seeing your perspective as a radiation therapist and it's oh, really interesting you. to hear like how what you've done so far in your your first year in the job so thanks again yeah thanks thanks for having me yeah, so we have we have a couple minutes here. We're going to go to questions very soon, but I just wanted to go over a little bit of information about, okay, so how do you get into this program and what are your options in BC? So there's ways to become an MRT through international education, but just for the purpose of today, we'll talk about how you how do you complete a Canadian program. So the first two steps are to complete your education and then achieve your certification requirements. And then depending on which province you work in, there may be a specific regulatory body that you have to register with to maintain a license to practice. So I've put a link there on the website that you can go to to find out where these regulatory bodies exist in Canada, if you're curious. And so in terms of education, you have to complete an accredit Accreditation Canada accredited education program at a college or university. These programs, as our speakers have kind of talked about already, they include a didactic and a clinical component. So that means you'll spend time learning some of the theory and most likely practicing procedures and simulation before you move into a clinical setting where you'll get to actually have hands-on experience working alongside a professional and practicing procedures with patients. And all MRT programs include a clinical component. And they're also all based on the CMRT competency profile that I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So you can think of this like a blueprint. Each program is responsible to map its curriculum to this profile. And that means no matter where you complete your education, all MRT graduates have this common skill set that allows them to practice safely and effectively in different clinical settings across Canada. So you can find a full list of the Canadian accredited programs at this link that I provided here, so accreditation.ca. We also have several options for you in BC, which is nice. Um, British Columbia Institute of Technology or BCIT, that's the only, currently at least, the only post-secondary institution that has all four different MRT programs. But there are a few different options uh, if you want to look into radiological technology or sort of that x-ray. These are called medical radiography programs. So this was mentioned earlier as well, but you could choose to go to BCIT, Camosun College, College of New Caledonia, and very soon we're going to have a new program um, that will is working towards accreditation uh, at Anderson College and their campus will be opening up in Surrey. And then for MRI, nuclear medicine and radiation therapy, currently BCIT is the only institution where you can complete these programs. For the most part, they are two-year diploma programs. Radiation therapy is a about a three-year Bachelor of Science program. So that kind of gives you an overview of the education offerings in BC. And then I've just put some helpful links here. It's always a good idea. If there's one 
one of these disciplines that's standing out to, to you or if you want to look into the program, go straight to the program website, look at their entrance requirements, see when they're having an information session, find out about their application deadlines. So that's how you'll be able to get more of the fine details about the specific program because there are some, some differences in, in their timelines and their slightly different uh, entrance requirements. And I also just wanted to share where you can find us on social media in case you want to follow any of the educational programs. They do features every now and then. They do promotions. They'll let you know when info sessions are happening. All of BCIT MRT programs have their own unique Instagram account right now. Promotion MRT program has one as well. And if you're curious about our association, you can also find us on there too. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to now open it up to anybody that might have questions for us and kind of invite our guest speakers to pop back in. Yes, feel free to be able to do that. And uh, I know I have some questions myself. I'll still be watching the chat to see if anybody does present anything. Um, this may be geared to yourself, Sarah, but anybody is welcome to come in here. Uh, I know that you just talked about the uh, application process and the admission requirements. And I know Savannah alluded to the fact of physics, but from a high school point of view, is there any particular courses that high school students, students where they might be, where it might be recommended? What type of uh, courses would be helpful for them to be able to get into a profession like this? Yeah, typically for these programs, it's it could be a slightly variations of this, but anatomy and physiology or AMP twelve. Yeah. Might also it maybe used to be called biology twelve. Um, English 12, Math 12, Pre-Calculus, and then Physics 12. Some programs are also accepting Grade 11 Physics. So have a look at the specific program, but those are the general subject areas that are considered for prerequisites. And then most programs also require medical terminology. Some of them require it as a prerequisite. Some of it is a conditional offer that you complete a med term course. And then they also often require volunteering of some some shape or form. Okay, good to know. Uh, good question here. There are, are there a lot of jobs available in the next five years? And what's the salary like? Now, when it comes to salary and wage, you don't, of course, have to give your own personal wage per se, but any sort of range as where somebody starting off in the field might be making to what might be a senior level of uh, salary, at least in 2024 dollars well there you go <laughs> i'm prepared i'll let the others speak about if they want to talk about shift premiums or bonuses or things like that but uh work bc has done some good work kind of they call it a labor market outlook to see what are the predicted job openings in our province over the next decade and so this was a stat that they shared on their website you can actually have a look and look up medical radiation technologists you'll find this number you can read a bit more about the details so yes, absolutely, there are job openings for, in our province over the next decade. And there's a lot of planned new cancer centers, hospital developments, expansion of services. If anything, the data is showing us that there's continuous growth and demand for the type of procedures and work that MRTs are doing. So I don't if others would like to add to that. Yeah, if you're looking for sort of salary stuff, um, for what's really good is we're unionized. Uh, so that means um, you have a minimum starting wage um, based on your discipline, and it will go up um, based on how many years you work there. Um, I think right now it goes up to six steps. Um, and so it's about a dollar increase every time around. Um, but because we're unionized, our contract gets ratified or gets updated every uh, four years. So that minimum rate does continue to increase with inflation. Um, depends on how good your union is, which sometimes isn't the best. But um, yeah, for X-ray, I believe starting wage right now is about $32 an hour and can go up to in the 40s, I believe. And then for MRI, I believe starting is about 36 and it goes up to... 48, I think. Um, it also does go up if you are uh, like Milo and working alone um, or working a night shift where you might not get a meal break. You do get uh, paid out for that. Um, I get a weekend shift premium. If you work on the weekend, you can get um, an evening or night shift premium as well. So that's just an extra, I believe it's like 70 cents or something else that adds on to it. 
Um, I also do call. So that that means between the hours of midnight to 6 a.m. I'm on call. So I get about uh, uh, about six dollars an hour to just be on call. And if I get called in, that's two hours double time minimum. And then you also get insufficient time off. So you don't have to, if you're working at 6 a.m. the next day, you don't have to show up until eight hours since you've left the hospital. So um, you do get benefited that way. Um, some smaller communities, I believe, do offer other premiums up north. I'm not sure if that's changed in the past few years, though. Um, actually, uh, coming from Ontario, um, Interior Health offered to pay for my move here as well. So I got all of my moving costs reimbursed and I do get a night shift premium. I do get a weekend premium. Um, I, my job is four on, four off. So I work four days on, I have four days off and any shifts that I pick up, depending on how many I pick up, um, I also get, you can also get overtime pay for that as well. So it becomes quite lucrative when you become only working nights and weekends <laughs> through that and i think that's where we're going to be probably ending off things at this point uh here's a reminder uh for school district 83 students and for those across the province at this point that the next virtual event will be taking place next tuesday march 12th as school district 83 will be hosting a career panel session on the agriculture industry with UBC's land and food systems faculty. If you wish to be involved or you're a teacher or a student, please contact your career coordinator or counselor at your school. If you're a teacher from outside of School District 83, you can contact me at the number and email that's listed in the chat right now. That's 778-824-1188. Once again, 778-824-1188 or you can email grichard at sd83.bc.ca. On behalf of the CAMRT, Sarah, the panelists, and myself, I thank you very much for uh, attending rather and learning something about careers in the healthcare sector. Have a great day of learning, uh, Cook's Jam, and Ilie. Thank you. <laughs>